Okay, so uh, first I want to uh, mention a few things, and that's that homework nine, and that's the last uh, homework before the exam. That's due Tuesday. It's not posted yet, but I'll post it right at the end of this class. Um, so then you'll have all that you need to do to study all that you will we'll have covered everything uh, that will be on exam two. Exam one, sorry. Um, I'm wondering if we don't get through the material today, because we have a, quite a lot to cover, I'll do a little video and post it. So also the conflict exam, that's due uh, Friday. And the office hours have been somewhat extended. So uh, we're going to have office hours on Friday, too, this week. And then uh, from 3 to 5, Monday and Tuesday, and none on Wednesday, exam day. So people have been having trouble finding this place. It's right, uh, right next to Cocomera, the uh, yogurt place on Wright Street, right north of there. Very close to the corner of Wright and Green. So, um, and here's the study advice, and on Tuesday, we'll have uh, an exam review. Now, in case we don't have time to do the eye clickers, let's just, um, just choose A if you're here now. Just so I can give you points for today in case we don't have time to do it, many of these. Okay, so everybody had a chance to do this. Well, I'll give you another eye clicker later on, too. All right, so let's stop this um, and go to the document camera. So we're starting right now on this chi-square goodness of fit test. And uh, and what we're going to do today are these two types of chi-square tests. And the first, uh, they're done in very similar ways. So when do you use chi-square tests? When you have um, a situation where you have more than two categories. Remember with uh, two, ca two categories, like zeros, we could code things as zeros and ones. But let's say we had three categories, like yes, no, and maybe, or what's your favorite color, and we wanted to compare um, and we have some idea, some hypothesized model, and we want to compare the data to that model. What do we do? Um, so we often have more than two categories. So we can't just use this, uh, the observed minus the expected. Because, for example, let's say we wanted to test whether a die was fair. Um, if we just wanted to see whether too many threes came up, and it was uh, that way, we could say, okay, if you get a three, you count it as one. If you get anything else, you count it as zeros. But what if we want to make sure that all the uh, categories, uh, the, you know, all sides are equally likely to land? So then we have um, six differences to consider, right? And we can't just um, sum the differences because, or take the difference, because some are going to be positive and some are going to be negative, and they'll cancel out. So what do we do? So we're going to square the differences and divide by the expected square difference under the null. And you get this statistic here. So you take the observed number in each category that you would get, minus what you'd expect with your model, and you square them. So this part seems... Um, reasonable, but you would think that you'd get observe minus expected over standard error and then square that. So why does it look like this instead? 
Um, so looking at this chi-square, you'd expect the denominator to be a standard error, right? You'd expect, here, let's just write it over here. You'd expect this sum, that sum, over all the categories of you take the observed minus the expected counts, right? These are just counts, the sums in each category, over the standard error for the sum, right? That's what you'd expect for each of them. But since, but you square them because, you know, some could be positives and some could be negative, and you'd think you'd get this, like the sum of z squared, which is really what this is, but it doesn't look that way. Chi squared is really the sum of independent z squared, right, um, right here. The chi squared distribution is actually this right here, but it doesn't look this way for counts. Why? Because, so you'd expect, let's think about it, you'd expect this, standard error squared, you'd expect that in the denominator, um, instead of this expected frequency. Because, you'd ex and this, we're doing counts here, we're summing things up, so you, the standard error would be what? The square root of p times 1 minus p, you know, it's just zeros and ones, times the square root of n. That's just our standard error for sum right there, right? Square root of n times the standard deviation. And the standard deviation with zeros and ones when we're counting is, you know, the percentage of ones times the percentage of zeros, right? That's the same thing. This is what we'd expect. And if we squared it, we'd expect this, right? Instead, we got this, the expected count which is just n times the average. That's what we got. That's right here. So we're missing this factor of 1 minus p. Okay, so that's one thing we're missing, but we're also missing something else. We haven't considered that, like for doing the six-sided die, that the six counts aren't independent. Because once we know five of them, the last one is determined. Like if I told you how many ones, twos, threes, fours, and sixes you got, or something, I just didn't tell you how many fives, and you rolled the die a <coughs> hundred times, you'd know the rest of them had to be fives. So the last one would be determined. We'll see this in our example. But, so, for once, st statistics is being really nice to us. It's not confusing, and these two missing factors go opposite ways and cancel. So we can use this, which is so much easier for accounts for chi-squared. So this is what we're using, and it's equivalent to that. It's really the same thing. So it's equal to that. But we can do it, um, but it looks like this, so it looks a little different, but it really is. Don't forget, it's the sum of independent z squareds. And we'll see that for one. Okay, so now the chi-square curves, like the t-curves, um, have different curves for each degree of freedom. Um, and the degrees of freedom for the chi-squared right here is the number of categories, not n minus 1, but the number of different categories. So if we're talking about a six-sided die, it would be 6 minus 1, which would be 5 degrees of freedom. Okay, now let's do our example before we go any further. And um, it's going to be this example right here on the next page. So let's look at that. And... Um, so, a die is rolled 60 times with the following results. This is what we observed, okay? And the null is always, you know, the, it's just a, the null hypothesis is that the die is fair. So let's write that down. So H naught is that the die is fair. And these differences, we, like, if it's fair, we should have gotten the same number here, and we got you know, too few ones and too many threes, but is that just due to chance or not? So the null is that the die is fair, and it's called a chi-square goodness of fit because it's, does this observed data, this is given to you, the observed data, um, <coughs> the observed data fits the model of being fair here, so fits the model. So you have to create a model and this is the null box. And our model, if, the if, the, if it's fair, we'd have it on every 
single uh, toss, we'd have the same number of ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes. So we'd get, these don't have any meaning, these are categories, so I'm just going to draw them as pictures. One, two, it's three dots, can you see that? Three dots, I'll make it a four dots, five dots, and six dots. These are just categories. All right, six categories. I didn't write them as numbers because I didn't want you to think the numbers had any meaning. It's just each one of these is equally likely. All right, and this is your null box. And, um, and the alternative is no. The die is not <coughs> fair. Not fair. The observed data does not fit the model. Does not fit the model. That these differences are too big to be due to chance, right? I mean, if you rolled it, so now we have to say, okay, so this is a null box, and for, since it's not going to change with each toss, you can just make it for a single toss. <coughs> make for single toss. That's what we did. All right, and now, um, now N is here. This is our N. So we're going to draw from here this box 60 times. And it's with replacement. Okay, so that's what we've got so far. And if you can't see, because I'm using a lighter <laughs> pen this time, just move up closer. I mean, I see some of you straining, really. Just move closer. Is it, is it too hard to see? Raise your hand. You're okay. Good. All right, so now we've got that. Now, what would we expect to see? Well, we'd expect, under the null, that, um, that each one of these, we have 60 tosses, they'd all be the same. So it's, it's 60 times 1 sixth, right? That's n times p. The probability of each category is 1 out of 6. So that's, the, that's our expected value for a sum, n times the average of the box, n times, you know, for each one, it's n times the probability. Okay, so now we've got that, and that's 10 for each category. But you don't even have to, <coughs> you know this. This is common sense. So that's 10 for each one. All right, and now what we're going to do is we're saying, okay, this is what we expected, this is what we observed. If we, if we got exactly what we'd expected, we'd have no difference, but we want to we get a measure of how far off from what we expect we, we are. So we just say the observed minus the expected. So we're six below here, we're four below here, seven above here, six above, two below, eight minus 10, and one below. All right? Now, if we, the reason why we can't just use the statistic in the numerator of the observed minus the expected, like we do for, um, because these are always, the observed minus the expected, these are always going to sum to zero. And we want to count all of these differences, not just one. Okay? So these sum to zero. So now, uh, that's why we're going to square them. So we get 36, 16, 49, 36, 4, and 1. All right, so this is our statistic here. It's going to be the sum of each one of these. Don't add them up yet. In case, well, they have the same denominator, but it's each, the observe, it's going to be the sum of all these. This is our chi-square statistic. We sum all these right here. So... We have 36 divided by 10, 16 divided by 10, 49 divided by 10, 36 divided by 10, <coughs> 4 divided by 10, and 1 divided by 10. And I got 142 <coughs> divided by 10. So that's 14.2. So that's the chi-square statistic right there.
Okay. Now, I mean, I could have added these up here, but the reason I don't want you to get in the habit of doing that and then dividing by 10 is because usually these don't have the same denominator. They don't all have to be equally likely, so you should do that. So now we've got our um, chi-square statistic, and our degrees of freedom is equal to the number of categories minus 1, which in this case, we have six categories right here. And the way you can think of this, this is easy to see, is if I told you, uh, for example, how, ma how many uh, sixes, fives, fours, um, threes, and let's say ones we got, so you'd know all that, and let's say I told you that added up to 54, and when there were 60 total, you'd know this one was six. Once you know any five of these, you know the last one. You can see it here. They have to sum to zero. Once you know any five of these differences, the last one's determined. So we say there's five <coughs> degrees of freedom, five independent. Uh, five of these categories are free to vary, but once that happens, given that you know n, the last one is determined. So now, the chi-square, why do, so there's a different curve for each degree of freedom. So let's look at the chi-square curves. And since the statistic, just to remind you, the statistic is the chi-square is going to be, it's the sum of the observed minus the expected squared over the expected. That's what we've done here. So it's always positive. It's the sum of independent z squared. Z squared is always positive. So it's going to be a curve that's only going to, I'll draw it here, it's going to be, start at zero, and we got 14.2. And we want to see what the shape of this curve looks like, so let me show you this one on the uh, document camera here. Oh, first, let's just look in the back of our book first to see what we get, So, because this is what you're going to have on the exam. So on page 236, let's look. And we have five degrees of freedom, right? So look at the line for five. And what was our, um, what was our, here, let me just do this. We just are looking right here. And we got 14.2. Um, so as we go across here, remember we're going further and further across. This right here gives you these p-values. And we're looking, this is the critical value right here at 5. So this, you could say this is the critical um this gives chi-square critical values at different p-values, also called alphas. All right, that's what this is giving you. They all do this. So now we have uh, a critical value of 11.07, and ours was greater than that. Our chi-squared was equal to 14.2. So it's going to be beyond this. It's going to be between 5% and 1%. Okay? So we can look at it more clearly on the, I'll show you what the shape of the curve is. So let's go over to our PC here. And um, let's get rid of this. Okay, so we'll go to the chi-square distribution here, um, and we have how many degrees of freedom? We said five, and we got a chi-square statistic of 14.2. So we're going to compute the p-value, and this is what the curve looks like. It's asymmetrical right now, and you can see that we said it was uh, going to be between 5 and 1, and we got, this is our p-value, it's a decimal, so it's 1.439. That's our exact p-value. Okay? So let's go back and write that down. And we can draw that curve approximately. It looked asymmetrical. It went out to sort of like
like that. And we said that the critical value um, at 5% right here, so we could say this is chi-square star, was equal to 11.07. So that means from here on in at 5%. And if we wanted to set that as the null cutoff to reject, we'd see that our chi-square is beyond that. It's at 14.2. So this is where ours is, 14.2. And we, when we looked it up, we knew it was between 5 and 1% from, from our table, but we had to go to the p-value calculator, and we saw that the p was equal to approximately 1.4%. I'll say it down here, p equals 1.4%. We got that from the calculator. But we know it's less than 5%. If you just, on the exam, you just have the table. So you could reject the null at the 5%. So I'll write that. The conclusion is um, to reject null, um, because r chi squared is less than chi squared star. r chi is greater than chi squared greater. It's 14.2, that's ours, and it's greater than 11.07. So that means our p-value is less. So p is less than 5%. All right, you don't have to, that's just the formal way to talk about it. You should just be thinking, hey, if the null, just think about it this way, when the null is true, we're going to get something in here, you know, around, actually, the expected value is the degrees of freedom. We'll see that later. So we're going to get something about 5 way up here. That's what we'd expect to get something about there. And we'll look how far away from there we are. The probability that we'd see such extreme differences. Remember, this is a measure of how far your, your observed is, how weird it is. It gets so weird that it's so unusual that we say at some point we're going to decide that the die is not, doesn't fit this model. We're going to go with the alternative and say the die is not fair. We're rejecting this null and we're going with the alternative. Okay? That's what it means. We're rejecting this null that's just based on this and we're saying no. We have strong evidence for the die is not fair. Do people understand that on the whole? Nod if you do. Do you? Okay, a question. Just two questions. So does chi-square always look like that where it goes up a little bit? And then N um, no, it doesn't always look like that. It looks different. The, for her question was, what does the chi-square look like? And we're going to look at this later. But uh, for one degree of freedom, it's very asymmetrical. In fact, now's a good time to look at this now that we've finished this problem. And I'll get to your question because that was what I wanted to go back here anyway. So it says, okay, so you get different chi-square curves depending on how many independent squares there are, how many degrees of freedom. If you have a lot of degrees of freedom, then the chi-square distribution starts to look like the normal curve. That's kind of like the T starts looking like the normal curve, right? Well, the chi-square does too. Um, now for small, except it's not centered at zero, it's centered at its degrees of freedom. We can look at it in a moment. All right, so we'll say, so I say, see these pictures? C P value calculator. We'll do that. For smaller degrees of uh, freedom, it's very asymmetrical. So why don't we, um, the chi-square curve with one degree of the freedom is the same as the z squared, because you just have one z squared, and if you have one degree of freedom. And if you sketch them, you'll see what I mean. So let's look at this. So here's our normal curve, and this is z, right here, <coughs> 0. Now what would z squared look like? That's going to be equal to <coughs> chi squared with 1 degree of freedom. And what's it going to look like? First of all, well here, let's just do it. 1, 2, 3. Negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. All right, so um, what would it look like? First of all, when you square all the negatives, they become positive. So the chi-square curve is just going to start at 0. 
And let's think about it. If you square numbers between 1 and negative 1, right, fractions like a half, that's a quarter, so it's going to get smaller. You know, between fractions when you square them are going to get smaller. So it's going to get, going to be really bunched up here. Like a half is going to go to a quarter. A quarter is going to go to a sixteenth. It's going to get really, there's going to be lots of values like this. And this area is 68%, and so will this area be. Okay? But now what happens for the values that are big? Well, when you square, like for 2, that's going to go not to 2, but it will go all the way out to 4. So it's going to start, it's going to look like this and go out forever there. And between 0 and 4, there'll be 95% of the data. Okay? Does that make sense? So why don't we check this out on the computer and you can see what I mean. So let's go to the p-value calculator and you can play around with this yourself. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but we can just check that out. So let's see if Let's look at this. So, so if we do um, a chi-square with, um, first of all, you have one degree of freedom. And let's just say, okay, let's say a chi-square of four should give us about 95% in the middle, about 5% on the tail. Let's try that. So we compute the p-value. It's not quite 1.96 is more, you know, because 2 is an approximation, but about 5%, 4.55%. Okay? Now, let's take the square root of that with the z, and we'll get exactly the same thing. So the square root of 4 is 2. So remember this number, you're going to get exactly the same thing, and then both tails together. So we go here to the normal, and now when we do a normal of 2, and we're going to do both tails, right, negative and positive, and now we're going to compute the p-value, and it's the same exact thing. So that's why I said z squared is the same as, with one degree of freedom here, is the same as the chi-square with one degree of freedom. Now let's see what happens as you increase your degrees of freedom. So we'll go to chi-square. This looks, this was a chi-square with one degree of freedom, and we had a um, 4 here. All right. It doesn't look very normal, but look what's hap if I do 100 degrees of freedom, right? You're not, 4 is not even going to show up. <coughs> Watch, compute. It's going to look really normal, and it's going to be centered right at around 100. It's going to look pretty normal, and it's going to be centered right around 100. Its expected value is 100, but it's not totally symmetrical. So here, let, I'll show you. So it's not exactly 50-50, but see? So that's what chi-square curves look like. Please play around with it. It's fun on this calculator. All right, let's go back to the uh, document camera and finish up here. All right. So now um, we'll do another problem here, just to make sure you know how to do these. So a town has 50% Christian Jewish, 30% Jewish, and 20% Muslim children. 100 children are chosen to participate in a community project. Of the 100, 50, let's write this down. This is what we saw. 50 were Christians, 40 were Jewish, and 10 were Muslim. Could this have been a random sample? Do a complete significance test. All right, so the null is that it is a random sample. The children were randomly sampled. And our observed data fits a model. So we have to have a null model. And what's our null box? It would fit a model that they were randomly chosen from this population. We had three categories. If we, ju if we had two categories, we could have done a two, just a um, z-test, but we have three. And we want to count all three, Christian, <coughs> Jewish, and Muslim. And this is 50%. 
30% and 20%. Okay, that's our model. And there's thousands of tickets, one for each child in the town. Now, the alternative is what? That the children were not randomly sampled. That this observed data that we got does not fit this model well. Or good, goodness of fit, if I want to use poor grammar so you remember it. It doesn't fit it. That there's too few, too many Jewish children and too few Muslims. All right, so now uh, what do we do? We say n is equal to what? Well, we chose, this is your n, we chose 100 children, and in this case, it's um, without replacement. Because we, we all want different children. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna use the same statistic. I'm just gonna draw a little chart to make it easier this time for you. So these are our categories. And what did we observe and what do we expect? Well, we observed, that's just given to us, 50, 40, and 10. And the sum is 100. Now, what do we expect? Well, we'd expect 50% of the 100. It's easy in this case because it's out of 100. So we'd expect 50, 30, and 20. But let's say it was out of some other number. You'd just say 50%. 50% of 100 here, and of course you're going to get 50, and then you'd expect 30, 50, 30, and 20 split. Okay, so this is 30 and this is 20. But it's not always going to be 100, so, so you know, whatever that number is, obviously. Okay, so then you get 100 total, and now we're going to say our observed minus our expected, that's what we have to figure out. So in this case, it's zero. We got exactly the same number of Christians as we expected. But here, we're 10 above, and here we're 10 below, and they have to sum to zero, so I'll always check. And that's why we square them, so we get the observed minus the expected squared, <coughs> and we get one, zero, 100, and 100, and don't sum this up because they're all over different expecteds here, right? It's the observed minus the expected squared over the expected is what we want. So this will be 0 over 50. This is 100 over 30. And this is 100 over 20. And there we get 8 and 5. This is 5. This is three and a third. Okay, so we get eight and one third. So that's our chi-square statistic. Now we have to figure out our degrees of freedom. We have to look at the curve and find the critical value there. And the degrees of freedom is gonna be what? Three minus one, which is two. So we can just go to the back of the book and we're gonna compare um, this to the critical values. So let's do that. So we have uh, two degrees of freedom, eight and a third, it's right here. So you can see that it's less than 5% greater than 1%. It's in, in there. So um, we'd say we would, uh, our conclusion is that, uh, that our p-value is between one percent and five percent from the table that's what we got right one percent so we'll reject the null at five percent if that was the significance level if the, if we had said we're going to talk about this at the end of the hour how you choose your significance <laughs> level but this is uh also called alpha you where you going to decide your null cutoff the convention is five percent so unless told otherwise let's use the five percent cutoff in that case we would reject the null at 5% significance level, that's also known as alpha, reject the null and conclude in favor of the alternative that the children were, 
good evidence, strong evidence that children were not randomly chosen. If you had to make a decision, you'd go on that side. We haven't proved it, but if you're making a decision, and if you had to make a decision, you'd decide that way. So we reject the null at 5% and conclude rejecting this one and concluding the children were not randomly chosen if you had to make a decision on in court or something. Or just said, okay, we're going to redo this. We, we've had decided they're not. We're going to do it. We're going to redo it. Okay. So that's um, the ones, that's the chi-square goodness of fit. Now we're going to move on to another type of chi-square test um, that has the same statistic. So you don't have to do it a different way. It's the same observed minus the expected squared over the expected, but it in, it, you use it when you have two variables. We only had one variable, multiple categories. Let's say you have two, actually two or more, <coughs> two or more variables each with multiple categories, then what do you do? You can do a chi-square test for independence, and the statistic is exactly the same. You're still going to use the same statistic. You'll still use the chi-square. Let's just remember it. Actually, I'm going to be giving it to you on the uh, exam, but it's the observed minus the expected squared. It's the sum of that squared div e dividing each by its expected but that'll be given to you. It's the same statistic, but the expecteds are figured out differently. So here's a real study that was done to see if um, tattoos uh, were, they were trying to see if tattoos caused hepatitis C, but in this is just observational data. So they just wanted to see if people who got tattoos were more likely to get hepatitis C. So it was a study, um, looked at 626 patients, and they were going, undergoing medical evaluation for s some spinal things, so they could, were, they could s photograph them anyway, and they saw how many uh, tattoos they had, and, um, and then they recorded whether they were, uh, they were unrelated to hepatitis C, but they tested whether they had hepatitis C. So they weren't coming in for hepatitis C, so it was a nice cross-section. I mean, it was reflective of a general population. So here's the data that they got, okay? So the null hypothesis is what? That hepatitis C and tat whether you have a tattoo or not are independent. That knowing whether somebody had a tattoo or where they got it from, these three categories, tattoos from a parlor, tattoo from somewhere else, or no tattoo, tells you nothing about whether or not they had hepatitis C. All right, so these are the um, observed counts. Remember, we're doing counts. Did you notice how we had to, yeah, everything is counts. Uh, frequencies are counts. Just expected values for sums. We're counting things up. All right, so these are the counts. Now, how do we get, and these are the observed, so this is given. And now, how do you get these expected? Because we're going to do the same statistic here. So think about it. The null says that they're independent. So if we look at this, if we look at, at, at this, the total right here, the total says that 47 out of 626, why don't we do it down here? We're trying to get these expected. So here it says that 47 out of the 626 47 divided by 626, that's, set, that's 0 0.075, that's where this is right here. So let's draw a little box so you can see. The idea is 7.5% of the total people have hepatitis C and 92.5 don't. So this is hepatitis C, and this is no hepatitis C. That's what, how'd they get this 92.5? That's 579, that's all these people, 579 didn't have it, over 626. 
and that is um, 0.925. So, okay, so that's the idea. And then you say, all right, if that's the case, then if they're independent, if knowing that they got it from a parlor tells you nothing about whether or not they have hepatitis C, then 7.5%, right? This is 7.5% have it and 92.5% don't. So you'd expect this 50 of the, the, you know, right here, you'd expect to get of the 52 people, you'd expect 3.9 of them, the 7.5% to have it. And you'd expect that um, the 92.5 wouldn't. And of course, they have to add up to 52. So that's 48.1. It would be the same split. You wouldn't expect them to have any more than that or any less than that. Same everywhere. So for all of these, you'd just take, this is how you'd get the expected. You'd take 7.5% um, of the 61, That's how you'd, ex you'd expect them all to have the 7.5, split, right? So you'd multiply that, and that would be 4.6 and 56.4, and they'd add up to 61, and you'd do the same here. The 7.5 and the 92.5 of these people, and you'd get... 38.5, and here you get 474.5. And of course, these all add up to 47, and these all add up to 579. And then you'd look at, look, the, uh, the tattoo, p you'd expect 3.9. We got a lot more. We got 17. And here we said we'd expect 4.6, but we got more. Now, with no tattoo, we'd expect, you know, this many getting hepatitis C, but only that many. So it looks like there's some evidence for it. Um, another way to do this, a very quick way to do this, that's exactly the same thing, is that for each cell, multiply its row total, which is 47. Like for this one, you'd say 47. That's its row total. We'll just do this one. Times its column total times 52 and divide by its overall total. And you can see why that's the same thing because the 47 over 626 is the point, that's how we got it. Is this, you know, it's the same exact thing. So for this one, if you just wanted to follow along, what would you do? You would take its row total times its column total and divide by its overall total. And you can see that 579 over 626 is typo, is the same thing. Okay, so that's how you do it. Any questions on that? Now, there's a lot of arithmetic, so what are we gonna do? Keep this open so we can look at it in your book when you copy this down, because now I'm trying to sum them all up. I won't do, this is, time consuming, but basically what I have to do these for each one of them, my chi squared is the sum of those. So let's look at our first um let's here's our observed. We had seventeen here, I'm just gonna write them down eight and twenty two and we had thirty five observed. I'm just copying this down fifty three and four ninety one. Now those are observed we're going to subtract our expected and divide by the expected. So for the first cell, we'd subtract the expected, which was 3.9, and divide by the 3.9 not squared, right? And we're going to do that for all of them. I'll just do the first row, and you can do the last row. Okay, so the next one is 8 minus 4.6 squared over 4.6. And this is 22 what? Minus 38.5 squared over 38.5. And 
just so you know. Oh, I went so far, I'll just finish it up. Okay, so this is 48.1, 48.1. This is 56.4, 56.4, and this is 474.5. And I added all those up, and I got 58. All right? So, oh, that was so much arithmetic. You won't have that much arithmetic on the test, I guarantee you. Um, so now we've got 58. Now, how many degrees of freedom? So, the degrees of freedom are equal to the number of categories minus 1 for variable 1 and the number of categories minus 1 for variable 2. doesn't matter which one you call variable 1 and which one you call variable 2. So we can say 2 minus 1 times 3 minus 1, which is equal to 2 degrees of freedom. And you can see this. Let's just look. You can see why. Because from 2 of these, like once you know this one, 3.9, you just subtract, you know that 52 minus 3.9 will give you this one, all right? So now you've got, so I gave you, just by one of them, you got this one. Now if I gave you any one of these, you'll be able to get the rest of them. That's two degrees of freedom. So you, you pick any one and you'll get, all right, now I don't care which one we pick. We could pick, it um, doesn't matter. Let's we'll just pick this one. Well, then if I gave you this, these two, well, of course, then you get this one. You automatically get this one, but you also get this one because 47, they have, these three have to sum up to 47. So if you pick two, any two independent ones here, the rest are dependent. That's just because you can always two, these are the two categories here, and it's two minus one, and these are the three here, and you need three, so it's two minus one times three minus one. So it's just logical. All right, so that's your degrees of freedom. Then should we reject the null? Now, you don't even have to really look at it. We have two degrees of freedom. The expected value would be about 2 for the chi-square. We've got 58. This is out of sight. It's going to be so significant. It's crazy. I mean, all we need, let's look. You can look at our chart for a p-value of 0.1%. That's 1 out of 1,000 times 2 two degrees of freedom is the critical value is 13.82. R, so 13.82, if you're going to draw the curve just as a quick sketch of the curve, you know, it's going to be pretty asymmetrical still. And when you get to 13.82, that's chi-squared. This is the chi-square star for 1 out of 10,000 times, you're going to get this far. So this, this area is 0.1%, that area. Now, where's our chi-squared? It's way over on the other side. It's way over there. This is a tiny, tiny, it's off this chart. So you know that um, all you have to say is what? Um, our chi-squared, should we reject the null? Yes. Our p value is minute. Tiny is tiny. Because what? R chi squared is 58, which is so much bigger, so much bigger than 13.82, um, um, which is the critical value at 0.1%. So that means, so our p is way, 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 way less than 0.1%. Overwhelming evidence. Hold on one sec. So overwhelming evidence. So, so reject overwhelming evidence of what? Overwhelming evidence that hep C, whether you have hep C status, depends is very, very, very connected to what? To tattoo status. So, 
in fact, what that means is knowing whether somebody had a tattoo or not and where they got it from tells you a whole lot about their probability, likelihood of having hep C. But does that mean a cause? Does that mean that tattoos cause hep C? Maybe, but maybe not. There could be, this is maybe, but maybe not. Why? Because this is observational data. So you can't conclude causation. You have to look, so you have to look for confounders. I mean, you have to think, okay, what could have confounded me? That would be something that's both causing hep C and somehow is causing people to get um, tattoos. Maybe some kind of, or tattoos are a marker, so if we got rid of this, you'd still get the hep C. Maybe like risky behavior, like um, risky, like having unprotected sex, ris risky sex and drug behavior. That could be a confounder. What would be a causal link? A causal link would be that the tattoos cause through, because, or contaminate, that you're using contaminated needles, so they transmit um, by dirty needles. Somebody else, you know, that might be it too. They transmit the hepatitis C. So if you don't get the tattoo at the parlor, if you, if you, you know, don't get the tattoos, you wouldn't have gotten the dirty needle, you wouldn't have gotten the hep C. So that would be the causal link. And that would be the confounder. Okay, any questions on that? You did have a question over there, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Her question was, is, is confounders going to be on the test um, and causal links? Yes. Look at the um, practice test, so go back and review that stuff. Okay? All right. You're asking good questions today that I meant to say. What? Good question again. Is chi-square always right-tailed? The right tail corresponds to the p-value, but a very, you know what this other, you'll never see left. So, so our question is, is the p-value always on a chi-squared right tail? And pretty much yes in all the examples you see, but the only time that you use the left-hand tail, this is zero, is it gets very, very unlikely that you're going to get exactly zero right, after a while, or very close to zero. So it's used to check whether people are cheating. Because when people fake their data, they're very bad at thinking about randomness, and they make the observed minus the expected too close. They make too many of them <coughs> zeros. They make them too small. So if you suspect somebody's cheating on their data, you do the left-hand tail, chi-square. That's the only time it comes up I've seen. That is too perfect. It couldn't be random, it, you know. All right, now we're going to do this one. All right, so now here's an example. I said it had to be more than two categories, but you can use a chi-square. You can always use a chi-square instead of a z when you have counts. So here's an example where it's often, we're going to do the same example we did, uh, the love at first sight example from, where was this, from page um, 78. And we did it as a two-sample Z. And now I'm going to show you that often it can, it's, you could do it as a chi-squared as well. Um, and then you'll see that your Z statistic, if you square it, will be the same as your chi-square, and it will be the same p-value as the two-sided. So let's just look back, and you can see what we did on page 78. It's this one, where we had two zero one one boxes. And we thought, oh, um, you know, is falling in love, men said they fell in love 44% of the time versus 36% of the women from a random sample. So we did this, so that's a difference of 8% here. Where is it? 8%, and we got the standard error. And we got 
the p-value of 1% for the two-sided. So what I'm saying is, if you square this, you're going to get our chi-squared value, and this will be the same p-value. We'll get 1% the same. So let's see if we do. Doing it as a... Let's try it. Okay, so now... So we have the same thing here, but we have to change these percents right here that we were given, 44% and 36%. This is our observed. This is what we're given. Um, we have to change those to counts. You always have to do that to frequencies. So we'll just say 0.44 of the 500 men is 220. And 0.36 of the 500 women is 180. So that means 400 people said yes out of the, you know, out of 1,600 said no. And we can get all the rest just by 220, 280, and 180, and 320 makes 500. All right, so everything adds up, and that's our observed. If they're not given to you, you change them to counts. Now, what would we expect? Well, it's the same data here. It's 400. We have to say if 400 people said yes and 600 people said no, then what would we expect? Well, here it's really easy. You'd have a 50-50 split here and a 50-50 split here. So we know it's going to be 200 and 200 because these are 50-50 and 300 and 300. If we didn't, we'd just do, you know, the usual thing. To get this one, we'd say 500 times 400 over 1,000. And you can see that's just half of the 400. And you could do that for all of them. Any questions on that? Does everybody understand? <coughs> Okay, so now what will your chi-square stat to be? This is m easier to do because the numbers are simple. So what would, your, what would it be? It would be your observed minus your expected. So that's 220 minus 200 squared over 200. And the next one would be plus 280 minus 300 squared over 300. Notice these are all 20 because there's just one degree of freedom here. So here, this one's also going to, okay, so now here you have 180 minus, and there are 50-50 splits here, 180 minus 200 over 200 squared plus 320 minus 300 squared over 300. So these all add up to 6 6.67. Okay? We can look, and the p-value, 6.67, oops, degrees of freedom. There's just one degree of freedom. Once you know one of them, you're going to know all of them. So, but let's do it. Your degrees of freedom is equal to 2 minus 1, two categories here, and two categories there. So that's one degree of freedom. Right? So, um... So, what am I saying here? Let's just go to the, okay, so first of all, let's look up 6.67 with one degree of freedom. And we said it will be about 1%, the critical value. It's just a little bit under 1%. We rounded before, so it's about 1% because just 6.67 is just a tiny bit towards small, smaller p-value. So we can say the p-value is approximately 1%. So the picture, let me just show you on the other page over here, we did this the other way, and let me just match them up. So we did it on page 278, now we're on page 86 here. When we did this, you we got 99 approximately in the middle between 2.59 and between negative 2.59 and 2.59.
And um, so our p-value was that and that. That was 0.5% and 0.5%. The one tail just would have been 0.5%, right? So, um, so our so that's the one p-value is equal to one percent, and that's the same as a chi-square test with one degree of freedom um, equaling, you would square that approximately, like z-squared, 6.67, um, same as p-value of, this is like z-squared, all right? So same as the two-tailed. So let's go to the, su do, you, do you understand that? Let's go to the summary, and it probably says it there. Um, let's see. Maybe it doesn't here. So let's just write it just to make sure that you know that um, that a, a chi-square test with one degree of freedom is the same as a two-sample Z test two-sided alternative. Okay, those two will give the same p-value. They're basically the same test. All right, um, so uh, let's just see how much we have to do left. I want to get through the whole, whoa, we only have 20 minutes. I'm going to have to go pretty fast. Let's see if we can do this. And then I can, uh, all right, so I think we can. All right, so let's try chapter 17. It's very, very quick. So chap <coughs> chapter 17 ha makes some important points about significance tests. First of all, significance tests can only tell you whether or not a difference is likely to be due to chance, not whether the difference is important. This example has shows uh, that let's say you had 10,000 men and 10,000 women and you found you know, a one point difference in their IQs, you'd get statistical significance because think about it, when you have a huge N, your standard error is so s small that you, you get, uh, note that with a large enough sample, any difference, no matter how tiny, can be found statistically significant because we can make our standard errors arbitrarily small by increasing the sample size. That doesn't make the difference important. So when you see statistical ex significance, don't mix it up with thinking that's an important difference. Any difference, no matter how tiny, can be statistically significant with a big enough sample size. And if you, you know, so, um, and the opposite is true. If our sample size are too small, we can overlook a very important um, difference because we just didn't get enough power. We didn't have enough, uh, a big enough sample. We had too much, uh, too much standard error to notice the difference. Okay, and the other thing that I really want to, to um, emphasize is that with enough tests, significant results will appear by chance. So if you run 100 tests, you can expect five to be statistically significant when the null is true. So, um, I'll post these notes, but that's, this is, so you have to report all, let's do an, let's go to the next example and you'll see what I mean. And I'll fill this in for you and post it. But an experiment on ESP is repeated a thousand times. Let's say there's no ESP and there probably is, there's no ESP. If it's reported a thousand times, about how many of the experiments would you expect to find statistically significant? At 5%. Well, by definition, when the null is true, when no one has ESP,
That means when there is no ESP, we'll find 5% of the 1,000 just by chance, which is equal to 50, 50 significant results. So you um, can't just keep repeating an experiment or keep doing it until you get significance. That's p-hacking. Um, that's just cheating. And a lot of people do that because they don't report it with the other ones. All right. Now, the last one. Does this, you know these thi two things don't mean, do, th do they mean something really different? No, they don't. This 5% is just a convention. There's no mass mathematical justification for it. Remember, these things are all curves. They're not cliffs. There's no difference. 5%. There's n hardly any difference. It's not like a cliff. It's not a sharp drop-off. Okay? Why pick 5%? Why not pick anything else? Speaking of which, let's go to the next section. All right. Type 1 and type 2 errors. So we've only considered this type of 1 this type 1 error. What is a type 1 error? So a type 1 error, let's just use the normal curve here, the type 1 error is what? When the null is true, when null is true, we decide, we do this cutoff, right? We do this wherever you want, right? Let's say it's 5%. So this would be 5% going that direction. That's th when null is true. And this is a type 1 error. It's when the null is true, it's the mistakes we make. Null is true. We make the wrong decision and dis reject the null. So we wrongly reject the null. And this is called alpha. <coughs> the probability of a, that's what we call it, the significance level. The P cutoff is right here is this sometimes we call it alpha right there where we decide this is the null cutoff but there's a trade-off this is when the null is true what if the null wasn't true then we have another distribution that overlaps this one let's say we'll put it down here let's say the null was not true so now I'm just going to draw another curve and let's make it shift it over this way. So now we're deciding for the alternative. But we let's say there's a particular alternative here. We haven't looked at this before. We're, but let's say that it looks like this. Okay. So now let's put it in the, this is when the alternative is true. So when the null is true, and we go this way. This is our type 1 error. But we can make another type error. Let's say the null is that uh, there's no fire. Let's say there's a fire alarm. This right here is whether the fire alarm is going to go off. It's measuring the smoke in the air. And so this is like when the fire alarm goes off and says there's a fire, but you're just cooking or something. So this is when fire, so fire, no fire. And this is a false alarm. That's what a type 1 error is, a false alarm, okay? But what if the fire happened? What if the alternative is true? There is a fire. Fire! Sure, when your alarm goes off, that's great. But here's the other type of error. You're deciding this way. You're, you're looking here and you're deciding this way, right? Well, there's another error. This, I'll make little dots here. 
I can make it blue and yellow. I'll make a different color. And this is yellow. This is your type two error. <coughs> when it, the fire alarm doesn't go off and it fails to, t uh, the alarm doesn't go off. All right? And then this error in this case is more serious. So you don't want your null cutoff there, right? Because these people are going to die. If the fire doesn't go, if the alarm doesn't go off, that's really dangerous. Where it's just annoying here. So you might want, if this was your detection system and you can't, the ideal thing would to do would be to do a better detection set, um, system. This is the fire alarm, right? So the ideal thing to do would be to um, make these curves narrower, make your standard error, your sampling error, much smaller, and so to separate them so this doesn't happen. But let's say you can't do that. Then you're left with only one choice, and which is to adjust this. Here's another good example. Let's say it's uh, a quality control thing with some important part in an airplane. All right. So when the null is true, nothing's going on, the part's fine. The airplane is not going to crash. Null means no effect, not just regular stuff, right? If you set it way out here, you'd think you'd make it really small so you don't have these false alarms and people aren't saying, hey, we think there's a problem and they're not delayed. Look what happens here when they're really, when it's, it is defective, you're raising the probability of the type 2 error, which is why there's a lot of faulty, um, you know, when you walk through security, they're very worried about terrorists, so they don't mind having a, a lot of, they don't do it at 5% here, what I'm saying. Doesn't that make, so people say, oh, let's make this smaller, or, or there's something sacred about 5%. No, it depends on the consequences. You have to think about the alternative. We haven't been doing that yet. We've just been concentrating this, but you have to think about the alternative consequences. So that's what this is about. Now this right here is called the power of a test, and that's the power to detect something that's really there, right? It's a power to detect. It's like um, when, when you really have the disease, it's like a true positive, okay? And this would be like a false positive. So when you're thinking about diseases, you have to think about the same problem. What are the consequences of a false positive? What are the consequences of a false negative, et cetera? So that's the idea. We have to go, but let me just finish this. Now, so, and here, here it is. Uh, so let's look at this again. So I did a little chart here, and here's the truth. The truth here, okay? The tr there's just two ways it can go. The truth, there's either a real effect, there is an effect, or there's no effect. The null says no effect, negative. No effect. Think this is negative and this is positive. Then you make a decision and you want it to agree. So you could reject the null that nothing's going off and decide that there is something, a false, it's a false alarm here, but it's a true it's not a false alarm there. It's a true positive. Or you could fail to reject the null, and you say there's no effect. This is your decision. So when they're here, they agree, and here they agree, but here's where your errors are, okay? And this, uh, the real effect is negative, but it's a false positive. It's, you made the wrong decision. And here, you have a false negative. You said there was, you know, so that's the idea. And um, these are all just, now the question is, here's what I did on the other page uh, very uh, informally, is how can you lower both types of errors? Because that's what you want to do. Like here's your type 2 error, and that's called beta. Sorry, I'm going so fast. And here's your type 1 error, and that's called alpha. 
okay? Now, how can you lower both? You can't because unless you, unless you either, um, you can do it by, um, you can't. Unless you lower your sampling er your error, unless you make a better detection system, unless you lower the standard error of the curves to separate them, to get rid of that overlap. You see, because otherwise you just, you just uh, look what you could do. Uh, if you want to make this one really small, like alpha, then look what happens to beta. It gets huge. So that's the idea. And, you know, um, I'm going to post the homework, and I can go over this uh, at the beginning of the review, because I know we went over it quickly. Okay? Just one eye clicker question I just want to do right now, because I want to ask you, um, I, I really do want to ask you this. Um, A, if you think that I need to, do you think this was adequate coverage of these chapters and you'll be okay? Vote A of the last two chapters. Or B, if you want me to do a little lecture and post it. So A, if you think this was okay, you understand it pretty well, vote A. Or B, if you want me to go slower and do a video of just chapters 17 and 18. I'm going to post the notes either way. I'll be posting the notes, uh, the filled in notes more carefully. So just vote A, this is good, or B, you want me to make another video, a video of chapters 17 and 18. So I'll, s when you're finished voting, you can leave. No, I